How many of you, looking back over this last week, you had a tough week? Okay. How many of you didn't sleep very well? <laughs> I want to explain why that is. There's a war going on in the heavens right now. In the heavenly realm right now. When I say heavenly realm, I mean the spiritual realm. There's a battle going on. Because the last thing that the enemy of our soul wants in this town is for God to break out and for there to be revival. Jerry, turn me down just a half a notch. And it's a real battle. A lot of us are fighting it in our sleep. And it's a time when we need to, or lack thereof. And it's a time when we need to stand. We need to stand with determination. We need to stand with fire because you know what? We've already won. It just hasn't manifested yet. We've already won. And I like to think that every time we come together and we lift up praise to the Lord, you know, worship is the best warfare there is. And when the word of God goes forth, it breaks strongholds. And I like to think that every time I stand up here to preach, there's a stronghold being broken. I want people to walk out of here freer than when they came in. And more empowered than when they came in. Because God has appointed victory. That's right. right? Amen. So Lord, I'm asking that you fill this message with your anointing, with your power, with your grace. God, even if some of us are hearing things that we've heard before, I ask that we hear them differently. I ask, Lord, that we hear them in a way that penetrates our heart and our spirit. I ask, Lord, that we hear them in a way that sends us out of here with flaming swords in our hands. Come, Jesus. Yeah. I have not been alone among prophetic voices in this country. I have not been alone prophesying an outpouring of the Spirit that's coming, that's near, that's imminent, that will come in with power and, 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 and intensity and an effectiveness like the day of Pentecost, but, with, but greater in its reach and greater in its impact. And a lot of us in this place for a long time have been feeling it like a sense of anticipation. It's like something's coming. We feel it in our hearts pulling us forward and it won't go away. It won't go away even when we see with our eyes in, in, in the natural and what we see in the natural seems to even lead in the other direction. So I want to review some of the promises that undergird any outpouring of the Spirit. A lot of scripture to read. Are you ready? Acts chapter one, verse eight and nine. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, even to the remotest parts of the earth. I wanna point out that's a promise. It's not a legalistic command. He said, you shall be, not you must be, not I command you to be, you shall be. Amen. Verse nine, after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on and a cloud received him out of their sight. Acts 2, 38 and 39. Peter said to them, repent. You know, they, they, he, they were convicted. They'd crucified Jesus. What do we do, they said? Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord will call to himself. That's a certificate of deposit without an end point. John 14, start at verse 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. In other words, believe what you see. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. These signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents. We are not going to have a serpent ceremony anytime soon in this church. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. 
It's my permission to drink soda pop. They will lay hands on the sick. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. 1 Corinthians 12, start at verse 7. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. And to another, the effecting of miracles. And to another, prophecy. And to another, the distinguishing of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. I could do a whole lesson on different kinds of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. Now, I choose to believe that if it's in the book, it's mine. If it's in the book, it's yours. God said it. God put it in print. He meant what he said, and it stands for eternity, right? And so you get phrases like these. The promise is for you. For all who are far off, all these phrases, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself, those who have believed, he who believes in me, each one, distributing to each one. So those phrases, they send us a message about who and how many the outpouring of the Spirit is for and how far he wants it to go. But I have a question. How many of us have this tendency to to, to look on when the spirit begins to move and the miracles begin to happen and you think to yourself, how does this include me? Or does it include me at all? And maybe you hold back a bit. I see Christians hold back. Spirits move and they hold back. Maybe they hold back a bit because something inside says that it doesn't include you. That's for them. Am I talking to anybody? Two clear things show up in these promises of God that are written in his word. And because they're written in God's word, they are more true for you than anything you've experienced or felt in your personal life. First, it's not about, it's not about the position you hold or the position you don't hold. And it's not about whether you feel you're gifted or not. It's about Jesus. And it's about faith. And that faith translates as a simple trust in the God we serve. These signs follow those who believe. And you've heard me say so many times, belief is never a performance. It's never an achievement. It's not some mysterious quantity of certainty that you muster up. It's a love relationship with Jesus that brings you into a place of settled rest and trust with him. It's not that you go out it's not that you, uh, you go out and you do supernatural things because you have to. You do supernatural things because you've been freed to. It's a release. You're released in love. You're released in trust. Here's the second thing. It's never dependent on human beings. It's about Holy, the Holy Spirit who has come to dwell in every one of us who pursue a relationship of surrendered trust with Jesus. These things that we're talking, these, these, these gifts of the Spirit, these, they're, they're, they're gifts of the Spirit. You know, a gift is not an achievement. It's something you receive. A gift is not earned, or it's not a gift, it's wages. So these are gifts of the Spirit, manifestations of the Spirit. They belong to him. They're his to work. I don't like hearing Christians saying, I have a gift of this or I have a gift of that. No, you don't. Holy Spirit has the gift and the Holy Spirit has you. They're his. They're his to work. They're his to dispense. Not you or me. They go way beyond human limitations. You know, because they're bigger than we are because because the Holy Spirit is bigger than we are. He transcends us. They're not limited to our humanity. These gifts, that these, that this, these, these supernatural things that we're gifted to do, supernatural love, supernatural miracles, they're not limited by our humanity or what we think of ourselves. They're not limited by what we feel in the moment. God's bigger than we are. 
and nothing that he does can be contained by us. Sometimes people say, well, God's a gentleman. He won't move without our permission. That's a lie. You want to ask Paul, while he's face down on the road to Damascus, sucking dust bookers up his nose, how polite God is. Can't be contained by us. Some, some of us remember Sherry Trump, Trumbath. She used to attend here years ago. She's moved off to another town, but she had cerebral palsy. And she was really, really hard to understand. I mean, she would come and she would, you'd, she'd be talking to you about the Lord and she'd say, I love Jesus, you know, because she couldn't speak. Cerebral palsy. Most people would have discounted her. Because she, you know, the cerebral palsy affected the way she moved. And so she would come up to, to pray for you. People would tend to discount her. But you know what? If you wanted effective prayer for healing, she's the one. She was the one because God can't be contained by the package. His spirit's bigger than our human limitations. We need to get that. When Holy Spirit comes to fill you, and live in you, he brings everything that he is, he's not limited by how many rooms you have in your inner bed and breakfast. (laughs) He's not there to rent a space for a day or two. He's there to stay. And he doesn't go rent a storage bin someplace to lock up what doesn't fit in your limited body or your imperfect character. And so what that outpouring of the spirit that we've been praying for and feeling and expecting means is that you have become a powerhouse filled with the Holy Spirit. It's time we laid hold of it. Same power, listen, when I say that we're a powerhouse filled with the Holy Spirit, I'm talking about this, I'm talking about the same power that called the universe into being. God spoke and it was. That same power is waiting for a place to express himself through you and do what he has always done. It's part of what I'm saying is you're capable of greater things because greater is he who is in you than he who's in the world. You know, these are gifts of the Spirit that enable us to do supernatural things in love, not because of you not from you, they're gifts, they're they're his gifts to anybody who believes and chooses to walk in them. 1 Corinthians 12, 31, earnestly, earnestly, I'm sorry, that's, yeah, 12, 30, anyway. Earnestly desire the greater gifts. Sleep deprivation messes with your brain, you know. Earnestly desire the greater gifts. And I show you a still more excellent way. Hunger for the, for the gifts of the Spirit. But go for the more excellent way. You know, this, you long for that supernatural power in love to be used as tools for the delivering of the love of God. That's what they're for. But it's more than just tools like, like you know, God gave you a spiritual hammer to whack somebody with. <laughs> The gifts of the Spirit are a means of delivering something bigger than you and me. They're not dependent on how you feel in the moment, not how anointed you feel or how confident you feel or how much you think you know. Holy Spirit just does amazing things beyond what we could ask or think. You might be hesitant to lay hands on somebody to pray for healing because you feel in yourself that you're inadequate. But you know what? Love is designed to carry you beyond that. Love takes you beyond yourself. A lot of people are hesitant to lay hands on people because they're not sure what they have. But think about this. Which is the greater demonstration of God's love? Somebody's sick in the hospital. Maybe it's a coworker, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a neighbor. They're sick in the hospital. You go to visit them, you leave flowers, and and you go home. Which is the greater demonstration of love? Here's the other, other version. To visit the sick in the hospital, lay hands on them in love, see them healed, and take the one home who used to be sick. Which is the greater act of love? And even if they're not healed when you prayed, 
What's the outcome? Well, what the outcome is, you've shown the greater expression of love with your prayer from the Father's heart in addition to the flowers in the visit. I mean, come on, people. And doesn't that count? It's the same thing at work, neighbor, somebody you sit by in church. And so part of what I'm saying today is because of what God is about to do, it's time to choose to believe what we've been given in the Holy Spirit. It's time to choose to trust what we've been given in the Holy Spirit and then begin to act on what we've been given in the Holy Spirit. I got a package of batteries over there, and you know what? They're no good until I put them in the, in, in the microphone. They're full of power, but they're no good. Now, I can't guarantee that everyone we pray for for healing is going to get healed. I wish I could. But I can guarantee that no one will be miraculously healed if we don't pray. And it's not just about healing. It's that moment when God touches somebody through you. You know, some of us are supernatural listeners. There's something happens because there's the, the power and love of the Holy Spirit is in us. And when we listen to people, it draws something out of them that draws the poison out of their lives. You might not even be aware it's happening, but that anointing is on you. Some of us are supernatural listeners. Some of, them, some of us have supernatural insight into the hearts and lives of people that says, hey, you know, God knows where you live and he loves you. Now you know it because I just told you. <laughs> I just read your mail. Some of us have that. Some of us have that supernatural ability to touch people for Jesus and lead them to the throne. There's just something that happens. And the list goes on. There's a long list. The members of this congregation, without exception, listen are being offered what amounts to a promotion to a higher place in the kingdom of God. Greater anointing, greater influence, greater love, greater manifestations of God's presence. Now, if I, I've never been in the military, but if I understand it correctly, in the military you can be offered, if you're offered a promotion, you have the right to turn it down. But you know that life after that would be a little bit more difficult, right? You can turn it down. But the outcome won't be good. We've been offered a promotion as a people. Each individual in this place has the right to say, I don't think I want that. Each of us has the right to walk away. Each of us has the right to ignore it or pass it by or just be an observer and not be a participant. We have that right. God won't force you. Others have passed it by before you. And what I want to say is no one here will condemn you if you want to pass it by. God still love you. You'll still be an important and cherished part of us. But would you really want to trade a lifetime of walking in the power of God for the illusion of safety or control? Or for a lesser life with fewer risks? So there are decisions to make to reach out and do it, to decide. There's decisions to make to decide to act on the promotion God has already granted to those who believe. He transferred you from darkness to light. Trans transferred you from being a rebel to being a son or a daughter. From being a sinner to being a saint. And the Lord, the Lord just popped it into my head to remind you that you don't have to understand it. It doesn't have to fit between your ears. You don't have to understand it. You just have to do it. I mean, I'm a pretty smart guy, but next to him, I'm stupid. <laughs> I mean, really. With that advancement, with that transfer from, light to, from, from dark to light, from being a sinner to a saint, with that comes a promotion, and with a promotion, listen to me, with a promotion comes greater authority. Yes. And, with, and with greater authority comes responsibility to use the authority for the benefit of others in the Father's love. Yes. A lot of people misunderstand the authority of the believer, and they go around decreeing this and decreeing that and look like idiots. I'm gonna tell you something. We've been, the heart of it is we've been given authority to love, and nobody can shut that off. The 
kind of decision that I'm talking about doesn't fall into, obviously, doesn't fall into the same category as deciding whether you want to buy a Nintendo or an Xbox or a Hyundai or a Honda. I'm talking about the kind, I'm talking about, well, I know you got your favorite cars. I'm talking, yeah, somebody said, just give me one that runs, I don't care. (laughs) I've seen some of the cars some of you drive. You just cut a hole in the floor and play Flintstones. You know, it's. <laughs> I'm, talk, I'm talking about the kind of decisions that determine what you're becoming and who you're going to be 20 years from now. I turned 68 years old last month, and I figure I probably got at least 20 years in front of me. I'm going to use them. What am I going to be 20 years from now? See, this is the kind of decision that'll shape the rest of your life. It'll touch every part of your life. It'll touch your family. It'll touch your friends. I mean, shouldn't every family have a supernatural light burning right in the middle of it that lights up the rest of the family? You know, some of you, some of you are breakthrough people in your family. Over and over through the years, I've seen one person in a godless family get saved and pretty soon, within the next couple of years, the whole family follows. Some of you have that anointing. So it's a calling to be responded to. It's a destiny ordained by God. Jesus said, many are called and few are chosen. Why? Because we can choose to answer the call or not. But if you don't answer that call, I can tell you from experience what happens. Because I've observed it over and over again. You can say, no, God, I don't want to go that far with you. And everything after that will carry a sense of emptiness. Emptiness and disappointment. I've watched over the years when so many people have said no, and I've watched the aftermath. I'm talking about purpose for living. You know, you take purpose out of any life, and disappointment will set in. Discouragement will set in. Sometimes depression will result because life will make less sense after that. And don't get me wrong here, I'm not just talking about healing gifts and and obviously supernatural stuff. I'm talking about the love of God flowing through you to connect with people in a way that reveals who Jesus is. And you can put a lot of names on it, like discernment that sees into the heart of things, or administrations. I shared this in our ministry team training yesterday, but when I look at the meaning of the the word administration, the gift of administration in scripture, and I look at the context that it comes in, you know, people think, well, the gift of administration, that's the person who sits at the desk and pushes paper and organizes things. The heart of that word is, the gift of administration means God has given you the ability to speak words into people's lives that turn the course. It administers a life. Some word you gave sets the course of somebody's life for good. Something clicks over when you say that word and life lines up and a destiny begins to unfold. Or in a meeting, it, 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 like, like this, it's the, administ- the, the, word, the, it, the administration is the word that says, wow, that's what we're here for. Suddenly, all the pieces of that meeting fit together. That's administration. Some of, you, some of you carry that. You speak into people's lives. You can put names on it like prophecy <laughs> or wisdom, a word of wisdom. Somebody's confused. You speak a word and suddenly it's wisdom. It makes their life make sense. Or a word of knowledge. You know something you couldn't otherwise know. Or just faith. But all of those things ask us to take an open risk to give to others what we've been given. They call us to expose ourselves as carriers of the wonder of God, and the light of God, the promise, the gifting, the power, you know, ministering supernaturally in the name, uh, in, in the love of God. That's our calling, it's our birthright. Every one of us as believers who've received the Holy Spirit, it's our birthright, we have a right to this. Because we've been given the right to become children of God. That's what the Apostle John said. I want to talk about four 
There are four major reasons that we might tend to shy away from all this and allow ourselves to either become mere spectators or be disqualified altogether. Here's the first one. I don't believe that what I'm seeing is real. And I've seen a lot of that. I don't believe that what I'm seeing is real. And that one just kind of sounds like brain damage to me. (laughs) I don't think anybody here would go there. I mean, years ago, I was just, as I was getting this ready, I was looking back over the years and there were things that I'd forgotten about until until the Lord made me remember. I mean, years ago, Cecile, who just led worship, I remember when one of her legs grew an inch and a half before our eyes and alleviated back pain. Remember that? We watched it happen. Zip. Back pain was gone. We've seen ulcers disappear days or hours before there was supposed to be surgery to fix them. Doctor verified. We've seen kidney stones disappear the, the night before surgery. They went in to do the, you know, ultrasound or whatever it is they do. And, and it was gone. At one point we saw, at one point we saw a steel rod disappear from somebody's back. We've seen blind eyes opened in this place. I'll never forget this. this, There was one little old lady came to one of our revival meetings a number of years ago, and and she wanted. She said, "I, "I I can't see well enough to read what's on the screen." And so it was hard for her to worship. And we prayed for her eyes. And she came back the next week. She had glasses. Came back the next week. She said, you prayed for me, but it's worse. I said, take off your glasses. And she went, oh. (laughs) People, we've seen these things. Over the years, over the years in this place, we've heard, there are times we've heard angelic song when nobody was singing. We've heard angelic instruments when nobody was playing. And I'm telling you something, only fools refuse to believe what's been measurable demonstrations of God's miraculous moving. You have to be brain damaged to be unbelieving when you see what we've seen over the years. We had, oh yeah, we've had food multiplying. When we made, you know what, I I forgot the numbers, we made like 80 meatballs to serve and we served 120 and don't know where the 40 came from. Or bicycles. Like 75 bicycles. And what did we give away? 100 and some? They just kept, God just kept manufacturing them. We don't know where they came from. That was on the Navajo reservation. You gotta be crazy to look at that and say, I don't believe it. Because it's real. Here's another thing that people do. They, they say to themselves, I'm not gifted. I'm not gifted. In this, culture we, in this culture we live in, we've been conditioned to think. See if, see if I'm not telling the truth here. We've been conditioned to think it's the special people on the platform who do these things. We've been trained to think they have something that we don't have. And so there's, there's one on the platform who's a performer and the crowd is there to adore him or her. That's been the American pattern for a very long time. The hero produces and you receive, he's special and you're not. It's been with us for decades. It's unbiblical and it's idolatrous. And here's a piece I wasn't gonna say. (laughs) Well, no. (laughs) One of the benefits of getting older is that you've been through a lot. And you learn lessons and there are things you observe. And I remember when I went to Toronto when the revival broke out. And people, people didn't go for the speakers. The speakers mostly sucked and they bored you. And the sound system was so scratchy I could hardly listen to it because I'm a musician. I've been a studio musician. And I go, ah, you know. The performance wasn't that. They broke every rule of the show. <laughs> Meetings would start at like 7 o'clock. And it would be 10 o'clock before the speaker got up because they'd have boring testimony after boring testimony. from. So I'm just saying. But you know why people came? Because God was there. And when you got prayed for, it was hundreds of nobodies whose names you never knew. Praying for people. Incredible things happened. And then I watched a shift. The superstars emerged. And they're good people. I have nothing bad to say about them. But pretty soon it was, oh, there's a conference coming. 
and so and so is going to be speaking, and now everybody wants to fly there because so and so was going to be speaking. When we used to come because the Holy Spirit was going to show up. And then it was everybody facing forward, waiting for something to happen from the platform instead of all that incredible body ministry going on. And it all began to die away. And I'm not saying Holy Spirit doesn't still show up, but it isn't like it was. Because we adopted something that was not God's model. The hero produces, you receive. He's special, you're not. But the scripture says, to each one is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. When we began creating the star system where we exalt a hero leader to the, on the platform to do it for us, and we began to fill auditoriums just to see and receive from that hero leader, all facing forward as a passive audience, we began to rob ourselves of the promise. We did. More and more when I travel, and I speak in various places around the country and internationally, they kind of expect that star system. You know what I try to find? I try to find ways, I did this the last time I traveled to Canada. I wanna find ways to get people ministering to each other. I wanna find ways to let Holy Spirit flow through the body. So this last trip, I just had everybody join hands and I said, just ask Holy Spirit to come and you pray for the one next to you while you're holding hands. And, and it was a train wreck, I loved it. <laughs> because we people were connected. See, God has not favored the big boys more than he's favored you. They don't have anything you don't have except a calling and an office in which they're supposed to inspire, equip, and release you. There's some of us, some of us don't think we're old enough in the Lord. You, you think you don't know enough to be gifted or to minister power, that's nonsense. It's the spirit of God, it's not your knowledge and it's not your maturity. You know, over the years since that Toronto revival began that we were so touched by in 1994, since then, gosh, my, my information is now at least 10 or 12 years old. The last I heard, there have been 45 resurrections from the dead in Mozambique under Heidi Baker's ministry. Some of them have been buried three or four days. If you think you've got to be mature or know a lot to raise people from the dead, I want to tell you, most of those resurrections happened at the, hand, at the hands of children from the dump where they lived. And so what I'm saying, most, I mean, orphans from the dump. So I'm saying, you can do this. You've been called to do this. And you were called to do this from the moment you gave your heart to Jesus. Here's the third thing, I'm afraid. I'm afraid some people are not only afraid to try to minister the power of God, they're afraid to be anywhere where his power is being manifested. <laughs> Why are you afraid? Well, some of us are afraid because you can't control the power of God. You can only flow with the power when it comes. Here's a stupid for instance. You take some people to Elidge's, the amusement park, go find the roller coaster. And you explain to the person with you, you know, the wheels of the, I want you to go on the roller coaster with me because it's a lot of fun. And you explain to them the wheels of the roller coaster are fastened to the tracks. The cars cannot come off. And you explain to them that they'll be basically locked into the roller coaster car. It is physically impossible for you to fly out. And they say, yes, I know, I believe you. And so you say, well, then let's go. And they say, I'm not going. And you say, why? They say, I'm scared. And so you finally talk them into it. And when the ride is over, you're laughing and they need a change of underwear. <laughs> because even after the ride, they still don't believe. Now what's scary about the roller coaster? Everything. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> no. Okay, here's the deal. The roller coaster is safe, the ride is a thrill, but you're not in control. You can't control the speed, you can't control the intensity, you can't control the up or the down, nothing. You're at the mercy of, you're, 
You're at the mercy of however that thrill ride has been set up. All you can do is hang on. When Holy Spirit comes, he's not always interested in how safe you feel. He's not always interested in confining himself to the limits of anybody's fears. Because that wouldn't be love, would it? He's only interested in saving and healing people. He's only interested in dramatically changing their lives as many as he can, as often as he can. He wants us to know him in everything that he is. And so he really loves to unveil his power. And he hates to hold it back because he wants to be known for the fullness of who he is. Matthew 8, Jesus cast the demons out of a man who'd been running naked, cutting himself and breaking the chains they put on him to bind him so that he wouldn't hurt people. The demons went out into a herd of pigs that ran into the lake and drowned themselves. And and now listen, instead of being happy about that, hey, this crazy man is not crazy anymore, the response of the people was this, Matthew 8, 34. Behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they implored him to leave their region. That scared us. Get out of town. We don't want God to be out of control. Scares us. I've seen too many people, leaders, congregations over the years get touched by the power of God and see his works of power who then got scared and told God to leave their region and he did. Or God tone it down. Never let fear of loss of control or fear of what appears to be out of control keep you from entering into your birthright and the power and the gifting of God. Never let that happen. Here's another one. When power is given and gifting is present, responsibility comes with it. A lot of people turn away because the responsibility comes with it. We become responsible for what we've been given. And some folks are afraid of responsibility. See, if, if, we've, if I've been given power and I begin to walk into, in, in that power, then I have to surrender. I have to surrender to the one who gave it. I have to obey him when he moves me, regardless of how I might feel about it. Father says to Jesus, I want you to go die on a cross for their sin. Jesus says, oh, please, please come up with another plan. And nevertheless, not, your, not my will, but yours. That's our life. If I surrender to the one who gave it, I have to walk in a higher place than I did before. I know, that, I know that if I've been given a gift of healing, I'm responsible to use it. If I've been given a prophetic gift, I'm called to be responsible to the one God who gave it and to the people that gift is supposed to benefit. And suddenly, I don't belong to me anymore. I've been made accountable for something that's bigger than I am. And so now my life has to change. And that's a good thing. Because the one I crafted for me couldn't possibly be as good as the one he crafted for me. I'm not a child anymore who only receives now. I'm an adult who's responsible to give for the sake of others. And so the fear of responsibility keeps a lot of people out of the flow of the power. They just, they remain spectators when we're really called to be part of the action. Next one is, what if I'm wrong? I want you to take this one home. God didn't call us to be right. He called us to be obedient. There's a difference. God didn't call us to be right. He called us to be obedient. Whether or not the sick are healed is his responsibility. My responsibility is to obey obey him. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. Preach the kingdom of God. His responsibility is what happens after I've obeyed him. Whether or not I deliver a prophetic word with pinpoint accuracy is not the point. Obedience, or at least the effort to obey, is the point. You can be so afraid of being wrong, you never give yourself a chance to be right. And when you're so afraid of being wrong that you never give yourself a chance to be right, then you've somehow missed the grace and you've missed the love of God who turns all things to good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I prayed for healing for hundreds of people over the years, believing they'd be healed, and hundreds of people were not healed. I was wrong. You know what? God loved me anyway. But if I hadn't risked being wrong through those hundreds of times, and if I hadn't risked you know, praying for those hundreds who were never healed, then the dozens who were actually healed would never have received their healings. I'm not called to be right. 
and called to be obedient. You'll learn, but here's another piece. You'll learn more from your mistakes than you will ever learn from your successes. Take the risk. We have the right to be wrong. Just be wrong in love. Minister the love, and if you minister the love, then no matter what happens, you're right. You got that, right? Minister, minister the love. And if you minister the love, then no matter what happens, you're right. <laughs> It's important to get that one. Here's the next one. What if nothing happens when I try it out? Well, Jesus didn't give me the right to judge whether anything happened. Get a hold of that one. Jesus didn't give me the right to judge whether anything happened. A lot of years ago, I was led, I, I was asked to lead worship at a mainline denominational church gathering. It was those of you who'd never been part of a mainline denominational traditional church probably have no idea what I'm talking about. I'm up there playing my guitar, I'm worshiping the Lord, I'm singing the songs, and they're out there. I'm playing rowdy in there. It was crazy. I didn't think the power of God showed up at all. I'm judging by what my eyes see. But afterwards, they came to me and said, wow, that was incredible. And I went, uh? <laughs> and so I learned to watch their eyes. <laughs> I, learned, I learned not to be the judge of what kind of power was flowing. Many years ago, Beth and I spoke for some, are you ready for this? Charismatic Mennonites <laughs> up in Canada. And they taught us Mennonite dancing. <laughs> I did a funeral one time. I did a funeral one time. I didn't feel the power of God at all. I mean, I'm doing, I'm, I'm leading this service. I'm used to feeling the power of God. I'm used to feeling the love flowing through me when I minister. I depend on that. I count on that. I didn't feel anything. I thought nothing had happened in that service. I thought it was dead as doornails. And afterwards, a couple who were relatives of the one who had died came to me and they said, you know, if we'd had a pastor like you, we'd probably still be in church. And I thought, okay, Lord. <laughs> I get the point. You be obedient. Let God judge whether or not anything happened. Because it's not subject to you. Here's, here's, here's another one. Some of us, you know, we're like Simon the, magi the Magician. Um, some want to do it for the wrong reasons, like Simon the Magician, Acts 8, start at verse 18. When Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray, that, pray the Lord that if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. I want to tell you something. Nothing will delay, nothing, nothing will derail ministry and the ministry of real power quicker than the need to be seen or the need to be recognized as powerful or the need to feel important or to profit from it personally in some way. See, the, the gall of bitterness, the bondage of iniquity, insecurity at the roots of your life has a hold on you and you need to be involved in ministry so that you'll feel significant. If that's the case, you're a user, not a lover. Or you're bitter when you're not given position. You're bitter when you're not seen as holy. You're bitter when you're, when, when you're not seen as powerful or influential or important. Or maybe you're somebody that has a history in your life of, of being rejected and, and being abandoned that's deeply rooted in you and so you feed on the praises of people who see you as being a dispenser of power. I suspect something like that was part of what drove Simon. He was afraid of losing his position of recognition and admiration. There was a need in him, a fear of being insignificant. 
not having position and it disqualified him as a minister of the power of God. And so God has called us into a time for wholeness. He's called us into a time to pursue selflessness in order to become stewards of the power of God. People that are safe to minister what God has given us. More than that, and this is the primary challenge to most of us here today, it's a time to say to yourself and to the Lord what Isaiah said to the Lord in Isaiah 6, 8. He said, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then he said, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. It's time for us to say with everything that's in us, it's me. It's me, I've been called. It's me, I will respond. It's me, I will take the risk. It's me, I will say to God, have your way with me. I will choose to believe that I have been filled. I'll choose to believe that I've been equipped and gifted and I will act on it. I will not be left out of the coming blessing. I will stand in it by faith and by the promise of God. I finished with this years ago when the Toronto thing was going on. I was working with a lot of issues inside of myself and I would go up to Toronto and, 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 and everybody else is getting touched and everybody else is getting wasted. Matter of fact, people would come down the line praying for people and they'd all be falling down and then the person praying would pray for me. I'm opposed, I feel nothing and so what was supposed to be mine would bounce off, get on them, and they'd fall down, they couldn't pray for anybody else. <laughs> but you know what went off in my heart? I will not be left out of this. I will not be left out of this that God is doing. No matter what I feel, no matter what I see, I will not be left out of this. And I've pursued it ever since. And I've said, Lord, whatever you gotta do inside of me to make me able to receive, then you do. I don't care if it's scary. I don't care how big it is. I don't care what I have to look at. I will not be left out of this. I'm gonna be a part of this. Amen? Lord, I wanna release, if you've given me authority in this place, I wanna release a whole new anointing on this flock. I wanna release a power like we've never known in the name of Jesus. I wanna release a whole new level of your move, of your spirit of revival and renewal on this people, God. I wanna light the fuse on a bomb that it would explode in this city and that it would confound the naysayers. Lord, that it would confound the powers of darkness, that they, the powers of darkness would be shamed and disarmed. Amen.